Hey everybody and uh, welcome. It's so exciting to have such a great big group here today. Um, I am Jane Torrey. I'm the chairman of the Adult Education uh, Christian Education Committee at Asylum Hill and I'm honored to be the one introducing our two speakers today. Uh, first speaker will be Earl Exum and our AHCC community knows him currently as our church vice moderator. But Earl wears many other hats. Earl is president of the West Hartford African American Social and Cultural Organization, from which he just came from a meeting, apparently a very exciting meeting with them. He's on the executive committee of the Urban League of Greater Hartford. He's the executive champion for the African American Forum Employee Resource Group at his corporation. He's a member of the ex Executive Leadership Council, which is a professional organization dedicated to the development and advancement of African American and Black senior executives. He's currently on the Board of Advisors for the Supply Chain Management Program at Howard University Business School. And what's his day job? Earl works for Pratt & Whitney and was recently appointed President of International Aero Engines, AG. Now Earl will be joined by Damon Carter and Damon is visiting us today. Damon also wears many hats. He's the chief human resource officer at Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company. He's a member of the company's board of directors and president of the Kadic Foundation. Damon is also an adjunct research analyst for IDC where he provides progressive HR thought leadership to the company's IT executive program. He recently published a series of articles on CIO.com regarding specific actions IT leaders can take to eradicate systemic racism in the workplace. And he's a member of the board of directors of the Nutmeg Big Sisters, Big Brothers, uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters in Hartford. So please join me in welcoming these two um, fabulous sounding speakers. Earl, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank, thank you for the introduction and then thank you guys for being here. Um, when Damon shares the screen, he's gonna show a list of the resources I've put together to have this conversation. I've said it many times, um, I'm honored to be here with Damon. I've read his works. He's done four articles on this subject uh, for CIO.org magazine. And it is probably the most clear and complete uh, compilation of the information that I've ever read. I mean, I've had all this stuff in my mind for a long time, but to see it laid out as clearly as he's done uh, is really, really wonderful. So I'm, I'm a bit of the warm up act here until we get to, to Damon. Uh, but Damon, if you go to the slide, I, what I put together here is a list of resource materials, and I'm going to Try to inform your, your view of being Black in corporate America using this, this information, plus one book that I, I forgot to add on here. I'll, I'll just speak to it when I, when I get to that part. So now let's start with framing it of what it's like to be Black in corporate America. And it is different. I, I will tell you, um, early on, I grew up in New York City. All the messaging I got was kind of post-civil rights. Um, and it was, you know, if you, if you do a good job, you'll get a fair shot. And, um, I will tell you that, that I've learned that it's not quite that easy. Um, I, there's many, many studies, as you can imagine, that show the experience of a black person in corporate America is very different than, than for the typical white experience. Let's start with where those differences start. Uh, there's a book that many of you are I'm sure aware of called Audacity of Hope by Barack Obama. And in that book, he has a chapter on race. And the piece that I wanna draw from, which I found you know, a good summary of, of the experience is he talks about that racism isn't quite as blatant as it was at one time. He said, but what underlies a lot of our experiences that as African-Americans, you don't get the benefit of the doubt, okay? You can think about that in more stark terms where we've seen it in 
the criminal justice system. Um, uh, con confronted by a police officer, uh, they have a split second potentially to make a decision on whether they're gonna pull the trigger or not. Uh, if you get the benefit of the doubt, you're in a much better circumstance than if you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Um, if someone assumes positive intent, intent uh, you're better off. Now, how does that relate to, to corporate America? Um, you can show up with a degree. You can show up with all of the credentials. And we're gonna talk about this more in some of the other studies, but you don't always get the benefit of the doubt. There are sometimes some underlying views that, well, maybe uh, you got that because of affirmative action. Um, somehow uh, you got the job because they needed to have a representative black person in the role. Um, so I've, my personal experience is I've often showed up and I've been with the same company for 25 years, okay? Uh, I feel like I'm finally at the point after 25 years that my credibility is, is pretty solid, but I will tell you it, it was hard earned. Uh, I showed up to new jobs, I got new promotions, and it seemed like each time I showed up, um, I had to prove myself all over again. Um, the studies will tell you that that, that is a common experience uh, for, for people of African descent. Now let's talk about a Harvard Business Review study that really, quite frankly, I have shaped my career around this study. When I read this study, I literally changed decisions I made based on this study. Um, the title of the study is Race Matters. It's very much about mentoring and how important mentoring is to your, uh, to your career. Um, and uh, it was from 2001, but I'm gonna talk about another study that quite frankly, just echoes this study. In this Harvard Business Review study, they talk about the differences in the, ex in the careers of African-American executives. So now the survey started with people who are already successful as African-Americans and then another group that wasn't successful and then compared them to similar groups of white executives. And here's some of the data that they found. They created a curve of the black executives promotion rate versus his white counterpart, two, two people effectively at the same position. So let's say vice president in a corporation. What they found is for the white executive, early in their career, they were promoted much more quickly. So they had a much steeper curve of advancement. And then at a point in their career, their curve leveled out. So they advanced quickly and then leveled out. The African-American executive by and large, got to the same point, but their curve was much flatter early in their career. So they did a lot more lateral moves, right? So instead of maybe going from level one to level two to level three to level four, they might be level one to level two, level two, level two, level three, level three, level three. So they did a lot more lateral moves. That would be consistent with this concept of not getting the benefit of the doubt. Instead of just having to prove it once at level two, you might have to prove it twice at level two. Instead of having to prove it once at level three, you had to prove it three times at level three. So as part of the Executive Leadership Council, I was actually at a conference with a CEO who was African-American of Kaiser Permanente. He passed away actually recently of a heart attack. Talked about how he sits at the highest level in the corporation doing what's called leadership development reviews. And he notices the difference in language when they're talking about promoting a senior white executive and a senior black executive. And he says precisely these words. He said, I more often hear when they're talking about a white executive say, I believe in him, he can do it. And when they're talking about a similar circumstance for a black executive, they say, let's give him a chance. There's two very different messages there. Right, one of them is almost in, is an endorsement. The other one, there's implicit doubt in this. So again, comes back to the benefit of the doubt and how hard it is, how much better off one would be if they got it. And I'm going to talk about a, another book that's not on here in a minute to, to to further emphasize that point. The study also 
sort of speaks to indirectly the false narrative of undeserved opportunities. So often you will find yourself if you're an African-American executive being the only one in the room. And there are times, and you hear it, because I now, I'm a president of a division. I sit in the, in the leadership development reviews and we talk about our future executives. And I will tell you, um, it makes a big difference having somebody who's been there 25 year, who's, years, who is willing to speak up uh, when these kind of conversations come up. But you actually hear in the room this concept of, and, and, and it's repeated again in another study, is that somehow when the success is achieved, it's attributed to something other than the individual. This false narrative that somehow this person got lucky and achieved certain results, which then leads to why one might have to prove it again. Again, the same thing of this, uh, this concept of affirmative action. I, you know, I, I, uh, when I got, you know, I got into Cornell University and, and often when I left my high school and I graduated with honors, I will tell you, I, I went to a private high school. My first year was a struggle because I left public school and went to private school. The standards were totally different. Um, I got my GPA up and graduated with honors, but my freshman year, um, lowered my overall GPA. But I received awards like most improved student award. I was an athlete and what have you. And I got into Cornell. And I heard multiple times from my peers, multiple times, that I got into Cornell University because I'm black, right? And I'm young. I don't know how the system works, right? I'm feeling very fortunate. Quite frankly, I don't know if that's true or not. So I go on to Cornell University and thank goodness I was well prepared and I graduated from Cornell University and made the Dean's List. Um, by that time, when people said that and literally would tell me that, that, oh, you got there because you were black. My retort often was, well, number one is, it's actually harder because I literally had professors that just cut me no slack at, at Cornell University. And it, it didn't feel fair, but yet I still was able to achieve what I was able to achieve. But I would, my retort would be, being black may have got me into Cornell University. It didn't get me out, right? And they don't put you on the Dean's list. There is no affirmative action for making the Dean's list. Quite frankly, making the Dean's list potentially is harder because quite frankly, many of my professors did not give me the benefit of the doubt, right? And, and, and many grades that you get, look, that's why I love math. Math is my favorite subject. You know what? Because it's right or it's wrong. Right, you can discriminate all you want. If the answer is right, it's right. I didn't like writing research papers as much because research papers is much more subjective. And, uh, and, and it's, you have to get a little bit of the benefit of the doubt sometimes on your arguments in a research paper. Now I wanna to go to this study, The Black p &L Leader. Um, the Black p &L Leader is by Corn Ferry. If you're familiar with with corporate America at all, there's a few big, big consulting firms, one of which is, is highly, highly regarded for leadership and personnel type of, uh, type of research and consultancy. And Corn Ferry uh, is, is one of the most uh, prominent uh, of these, these companies. And they did a study along with the Executive Leadership Council, which as, as uh, Jane mentioned earlier, I am a part of. And they talked about the same, it was a very similar study to the Harvard Business Review that the Corn Ferry Report is much more recent than 2001. And effectively it arrived at the exact same conclusions, right? Many, many years later that people of African descent have to prove themselves more times at more levels in the organization to get the opportunity. It also talked about how difficult it is for a person of African descent to get sponsorship. So I mentor a lot of people and a lot, when African-American people come into my office and they say, Earl, I would like to be an executive. I'd like to be like you. I ask a lot of questions, give a lot of advice, but over time, if I get to know them and believe they have the potential, one of the questions I ask is, have you ever been over to one of your colleagues' homes for dinner? And how personal are your personal relationships with your, your colleagues? That's an important question because it's much, much harder 
for people of African descent to create those personal relationships. And if you think about it, I'll ask you to think about it. How often do you have African-American colleagues to your home for dinner? I always tell people who really wanna be an executive, if the only time you're spending with your colleagues is between nine and five, you're missing out on a whole lot of information you need to be an executive in the company, okay? Um, I wanna back up just a little bit because I left out a book. It's called Micro Messaging by Stephen Young. You may have heard of microaggressions. This, this book is about micro messaging and I'll give you an example. It goes back to this, this story I told you about the CEO at Kaiser Permanente. What happens in, in life, but certainly in corporate America is there's subtle messages that are given out. So for example, if I truly believe in somebody who's working on my, in my organization, I truly believe that person is gonna be an executive there's certain messages, like for example, they enter a room and I greet them like, sort of like we greeted, you know, I greeted John Baring. Hey, John Baring, right? I think there's a message that I sent to everyone that I have fondness for John Baring. I have an affinity for John Baring. Um, and then the next person comes in and you're like, uh, and you're more formal. Uh, he hello, Tracy, it's, it's nice, to, nice to see you. Um, you've sent a, a micro message. And what happens is these micro messages are read by the other people in the room. So now John Baring comes in and people get the message, ooh, John Baring is thought of highly by Earl Exum, who's the president of our division. So now John Baring is in a meeting later with his colleagues and he's speaking. Well, all of a sudden, everyone is listening to what John Baring has to say. Why? Because I sent a message in the organization that John is highly regarded. Then when I come into the room, I notice, wow, everyone's listening what to John Baring has to say. I told you he was a great leader. Look how they listen to him, <laughs> right? But effectively it was a self-fulfilling prophecy because I already gave the organization a message that John is the guy. So it feeds on itself. So this is something that this, these studies show is that well, gosh, if everybody thinks John is great, because first of all, Earl sort of anointed him, and then all of a sudden he just looked like a great leader, John starts getting promoted very quickly. Well, if that same message wasn't sent about Earl, then Earl has to prove it again and again until finally some of that messaging goes out. So micro-messaging by Stephen Young. I wish I had put it on here. It really is a powerful book about the subtleties that happen in corporate America which then leads me to this book, Empowering Yourself. And I will tell you, the Harvard Business Review, Race Matters. You know, I, I, I keep picking on John, because John, you're on my screen. That's why I actually <laughs> keep picking on you. And of course, I'm fond of you, as everyone knows now. But, you know, John left our corporation. Uh, we met at Pratt & Whitney. He left our corporation, you know, probably in the first decade that we worked together. And he was a brilliant executive who's done extremely well. Um, I stayed at the same company, though I had many opportunities to leave and make more money, but I stayed because this study said that the most successful African-Americans stayed in their company. And they deduced that the reason why they were more successful is because when you leave and you have to start over, all over to build your credibility, it takes much longer for an African-American to rebuild the credibility because presumably by my case that I'm making here, because you will not start off with the benefit of the doubt. Doesn't matter that you're an executive at Pratt Whitney, doesn't matter that you have an Ivy League degree and two masters, you will have to prove it again. And because this study suggests to me and my own experience suggests to me by staying with the same company for 25 years, I feel like I have a stronger voice, quite frankly, to advocate for positions that I'm taking in this discussion because I've proved it over 25 years. And I will tell you, it's not, it wasn't easy. I had, I've worked for at least two boys bosses that I believe extended my, the, 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 the delayed the advancement simply because they gave me the opposite of the benefit of the doubt. They, they looked for opportunities to suggest that I couldn't do what I eventually did. And I could go on on long stories there, but I really do want to get you to Damon. So I, Later on, if we have time, I can tell you some more about my personal experiences there. 
But I will tell you, it was also balanced out by bosses that uh, were just phenomenal mentors. And without those mentors, it's almost impossible. So that's where I want to get to empowering yourself. This book has also informed, I make every mentee of mine, because I have a lot of people that want to speak to me and I'm open, I have an open door. Lunchtime is my time to mentor people. If I have a lunch available, you got a spot to, to be mentored. But it's an investment in time and I want to see a mutual investment. So I ask each mentee that comes to speak to me, read this book and then come back to me. Because now I know we can have a productive conversation. This book talks about this concept called PI, performance image exposure. And if this had some Q&A interaction, I would ask all of you, what do you think is the most important as an executive to advance? Is it performance, is it image, or is it exposure? And this book makes the case, and it's been made in other studies as well, that early in your career, it's performance, right? You gotta come in, we hired you to do a very specific job, and if you can do it and consume as few resources as possible, that's what we want and that will get you promoted. For many African-Americans, or certainly in my experience, my father owned his own business. Um, he had no concept of corporate politics or you know, norms or anything like that. Fortunately, I worked on Wall Street for my summer internships and got a good lesson on it at a minimum how to dress. Um, but my parents would have taught me Earl, keep your head down, work hard, deliver results, and that will get you promoted. And it will in the early stage of your career. Image is important. The way I describe image is you generally, I'm sure you could point out at least one or two examples, but generally you don't become president and start looking presidential. You look presidential, then you become president, right? So you have to, you have to show the image that you can be a leader in the company first. And then exposure is, this is how I describe exposure. Exposure is when people know you, because obviously if you're doing the best job in the world and nobody knows it, you're not gonna get promoted. They have to know you, they have to like you, and they have to trust you. And I always tell my mentees, if you're not an executive at Pratt Whitney, you're just a kind of a junior manager in the company. And let's say you volunteer at a nonprofit and you embezzle money and you get caught and while you're embezzling money and uh, they're doing an investigation, they find out you also abuse your spouse. Then in the newspaper, it's gonna say, let's say Earl Exum, West, West Hartford resident, is caught embezzling money and abusing his spouse. But if you're an executive at Pratt & Whitney, the headline is gonna read, Pratt & Whitney executive <laughs> gets caught embezzling money and abusing his spouse. So. The corporation has to trust that you are going to be a good representative of the company and a steward of the company's values. Now, if you are assessing what's the most important at the executive rank, this book would suggest to you, and my personal experience suggests to you, that at the executive ranks, it's only 10% performance, it's 30% image, and it's 60% exposure. Now, let me try to explain the logic. Everyone at the executive rank performs. There's, there's very few positions at the senior executive ranks. There's more, there's, I will assure you, there's more people that could be president of the division that I'm president of at Pratt & Whitney than me who already work for Pratt & Whitney, okay? That's not true in every company. Some companies have to go outside and find someone, but at a company that has the longevity that people have at Pratt & Whitney, there are other people that could do this job. And if something happened to Earl Exum tomorrow, I assure you that division would continue to go on and they would find another president who I hope wouldn't do quite as good a job as me, but would probably be a good caretaker of the business, right? So I would argue there's plenty of people who get at the level that I, that I have reached or close to it that perform. So performance, actually doesn't become a distinguishing factor. In fact, anybody who's worked in corporate America watches people get promoted and they're saying, how did that happen? Like that person made a bad decision and practically lit a half a million dollars or half a billion at our company because we deal in much bigger numbers, half a billion dollars on fire and they still got promoted, right? It's because at, this, at the senior levels, people already have the image. People already have the performance. 
Now it becomes, who do the people who make the decision know, like, and trust? Come back to the discussion I just had about when I asked my, my pe people of color who I mentor, if I ask you, have you had dinner at the house of one of your colleagues? It becomes very relationship oriented at the most senior levels. And if you haven't formed those relationships, it's much harder to get there, to get the micro messaging that supports your career and those things that go on. So the exposure piece is very important. And quite frankly, it takes people of African descent a longer time to get the exposure and to get the endorsement that you need to become a senior leader in the company. Lastly, I wanna talk about diversity wins. So McKinsey, as I spoke about Corn Ferry being one of the eminent sources of consultancy on leadership and individual and executive development, McKinsey is another one of those companies that when it comes to management information, management systems, uh, they are widely regarded, widely regarded and, and well-regarded. And oh, by the way, very expensive. If you decide to try to employ them at your corporation, you sign up to spend the first million and then, then wait for them to ask for more. But what this study talks about, I think we sent it out in advance, is it talks about the importance of diversity. In four independent studies, it, it looked at things like, how many women and minorities do you have on your board of directors? And then it made a distinction between companies that have women and minorities on their boards and their performance versus companies that did not. And they found, at least in the fourth study, it was different, different amounts on each study, but I think in the fourth study, they showed about a 30% difference in performance, which means if you are investing your money and buying stock in a public company, it would be statistically and data significant for you to know if there are women and minorities on the board of directors, because your investment would get a better return from those companies. There's similar studies that show that having diversity, women, they primarily use women and minorities to, to signify diversity. Though diversity has a broader meaning, um, but just, just for this study, if you have more women and minorities in leadership, you actually have a more ethical company. Why might that be? Because you tend to get different viewpoints and quite frankly, different relationships. What happens often is the people who get promoted and this, this, there's a great, a great um, Business Week article that I've always loved. And it was entitled, Why CEOs Fail. And they determined in this article that the number one reason why CEOs fail is because they surround themselves with their friends. This comes back to exposure. Who do I know? Who do I like to? Or who do I trust? Well, if I surround myself with all people who I'm very familiar with, who I have a personal relationship with, I'm less likely to have people who are going to challenge my way of thinking, who are going to push back on, on my direction. And when and if I were to do something that borderlines on ethical, it's less likely if I've quite frankly promoted people that I have a strong relationship, which happens all the time in corporate America, all the time. And I can explain why it actually makes sense to do that at times, but when you promote people who come from a different background, whose career has not necessarily passed through the same division as you. I don't know if you guys, if you pay attention to corporate America, you ever notice when the CEO changes, the whole leadership team changes within about 18 months? Because what typically happens is, one, some of the people who also wanted that job and didn't get it, there's a little bit of a, a rub there, right? And then it's because people like to bring people who they know, who they trust, that I can trust that you're gonna make good decisions because I've worked with you in the past. The dilemma with choosing people you've worked with in the past is they've often, come out of the same business unit. So when you're in a large corporation, you have multiple lines of business. But often what, ha what happens is a CEO will take the position and they will promote people who came out of the same line of business from which they came. 
just because they had the opportunity to work with those people. Um, that ends up leaving you in a position where you will get less pushback. You will get less diversity of perspective, not just diversity as defined by women, minorities, what have you, different experiences coming out of different businesses. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a problem when you surround yourself with people like yourself because you won't get enough diverse perspectives. As a result, you don't get challenged as much. Ethical issues don't get raised as much. And quite frankly, you don't consider all of your alternatives. This is what the study effectively validates is that diversifying your leadership team brings a lot of value. There's a, there's a quite often used exercise that some of you may have heard of where they, they take a group of people uh, and simulate that you, you, your plane crashed and you have a list of about 20 items, 15 to 20 items, and you have to select of those items, if you can't bring them all, which are the most important to bring? And they put this study and they say, I'm gonna put all people who are similar, they all are engineers, let's say, or they're all white males. Um, and I'm gonna have them select the top items. And then, and, and, I'm, and experts, you say, I'm gonna actually put experts on the team. And then you do this same simulation with people who aren't experts or who have more diversity in color and race or have different educational backgrounds. They're not all engineers, there's an engineers and HR and accountants and what have you. Consistently, consistently, they've done this, they've done this exercise over and over and over again. Consistently, the more diverse the group who makes the selection, the better the overall selections, the most optimal solutions happen. This is the case for diversity. So before I turn it over to Damon, effectively my argument to you is that we actually as corporations shoot ourselves in the foot. We leave money on the table. If you would tell me, which I have, which this study tells you, that I could have up to 30% financial, better financial performance by diversifying my team, then we're leaving money on the table by not diversifying our team. To still have so few black people on the board of directors of companies, which Damon's gonna show you statistics, is literally leaving money on the table, which we continue to do as corporations. So just as an investor, you should take an interest in the diversity of the leadership team and the diversity of the board of directors of any company that you invest in. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Damon and then he's gonna give you the real data and the real, the real um, information that, that, that I think will inform you. Well, thank you, Earl. Um, first of all, I, I just, it's a, I think you did a tremendous job making the case. I can tell you that over my 25 year at a career in human resources, everything you just stated, I've seen play out in various environments, supporting various functions. Um, I've had the uh, privilege of being able to work for some, several of the largest organizations in the country, uh, GE, UTC, Express Scripts, Aetna, um, and Daimler Chrysler. And I've seen uh, the, the, key, the, the, the examples of everything you just touched on. Um, because I often, as an HR leader, get to sit back and facilitate those LDR, those leadership development discussions. I'm not the decision maker in the room, but I'm facilitator. And I get to observe what, how those decisions are made. And a lot of what you just mentioned, I have seen play out uh, firsthand. Um, and, and, and it's a, it's a very real, it's the reality, it's our reality. It's the reality of black talent in, in, in corporate America. Um, so that being said, I wanna uh, accomplish a couple things. Uh, as, as Errol mentioned, we're gonna, I wanna kind of talk about what's the impact of all this. I think that um, it's important to understand the data and, and Earl referenced a couple uh, great uh, reports. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on a couple other reports here um, before we get into solutioning. So uh, before I speak to this report called Being Black in Corporate America that came out I think in 2019, uh, which was published by the Center for Talent Innovation, um, you know, we work to make money, right? Uh, we work to make a living. Um, so one of the major impacts, uh, and I'd be remiss to not mention it, is the money in our pocket, money earned, and the disparity that has continued to exist for uh, Black employees, Black talent, 
um, here in corporate America. Uh, and the data, I've seen data, you know, it, it, it changes um, from report to report. But for instance, um, in 2018, uh, Black women made 66, 62 cents for every dollar um, that their white counterparts made. I've seen similar data for Black men, um, even south of that as well, below 60 cents for every dollar um, for, for, for their white counterparts in similar positions. So if you think about that, the, in, the cumulative impact of that over time across, the organi uh, across a, 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 a group of people, you get to this idea of the media, this wealth gap that exists right now. Um, and there, you know, and once again, the data is kind of always changing. But one thing that's pretty consistent is the wealth gap between black, the black, a median black household and a, a white uh, median household is significant. Um, back in 2016, um, the black households, uh, median work, net worth of a black household was $17,150 uh, compared to a median. Uh, uh, net worth of a white family in 2016 was 171,000, tenfold difference. And that has been consistent, not recent, but it's been consistent for the last 70 years. Despite all the changes, despite all the policies, despite all the, the improvements um, and access, there's still this gap that exists. So there's definitely a pay impact um, as a result of this, um, some of the, the, the kind of cumulative impact of these, these, uh, uh, these experiences. When you look at the slide here, um, as stated by this report, um, representation of black talent, both women and men in corporate America, the C-suite less than a percent uh, when this report was run back in 2019. And uh, it may have creeped up just maybe a digit, maybe not, um, I've, it, it's still extremely low. Um, we look at the C-suite um, in, in corporate America. Um, executive and senior manager roles, 3.2%. And then professionals across corporate America, only 8%, which is a, a shocking number. 40% uh, of professionals say their company has effective DNI efforts. So there's, there's this attention to DEI and it has been for the past 20, 30 years. Um, but there's still a, a, a gap there. Only, or they say only 40% of professionals feel like the company's really focused on it in a genuine way. Um, more than 30% of black employees intend to leave their companies within two years. Uh, back to Earl's comments about the benefit of staying with your organization to build that credibility. Um, there's a, a high percentage of black talent that doesn't expect to be around for more than uh, two years uh, with their organizations. Um, black professionals are more than likely than any other ethnic group uh, to encounter racial pre prejudice at work. And black employees are 3.6 times as likely as their white colleagues to be planning to start their own ventures. So gaining the experience within corporate with a plan to you know, leave and start their own ventures to get a, really escape from some of the, the uh, unfair treatment uh, that they may be experiencing. This next report is a little more laser focused on the state of black women in corporate America. Um, and there is a difference um, between black men's experience and black women's experience in corporate America. Um, and these are just a couple of bullets I wanted to call out uh, based on this study by Lean In and the McKinsey and Company um, annual women in workplace study. And this report just came out last year. Uh, managers are less likely to advocate for black women. Um, you know, black women are much less likely than their non-black colleagues to interact with senior leaders at work. Once again, going back to Earl's comment about exposure and, and, and sponsorship and mentoring, um, there's, there's a major gap. Despite their interests, they're, they're, you know, black women are very, uh, in this report stated very clearly, they're very, they, black women are ambitious. They want to succeed, they want to excel, um, but they, they still, don't receive the same type of uh, access to senior leaders at work. Uh, black women experience a wider range of microaggressions um, at work. Um, a couple of examples of those are having competence questioned or being disrespected in the workplace. Um, they're often the they, they, they are often the only one at the table or in the department. Uh, so their their only experience is far too common. And less than half of black women feel that they personally have strong allies at work, which is also very important to anyone's success uh, in the workplace. 
continuing on um, a couple data points on uh, corporate board representation. As Earl mentioned, this is a huge opportunity and money is being left on the table. Um, so this is what this, this report just came out uh, last week, actually, um, and it was issued by SHRM, um, the Society for uh, Human Resource Management. And uh, you see the numbers here, 83.9% uh, um, our, our, uh, our representation is white on the board, on board of directors in the Fortune 500. Uh, Eight point six percent African American or Black, uh, three point eight percent uh, Hispanic, and three point seven percent Asian or Pacific, Asian Pacific Islander. Um, so, once again, the numbers are extremely low. Even though there's been a lot of focus on it, particularly over the last you know six months, maybe a year or so, um, they're still extremely low. And it'll be interesting to see what the numbers look like uh, when they compile uh, 2020. Now, we, uh, now this, there's also good news in reporting that there have been some incremental gains. Once again, this has been a focus area um, uh, for a little bit, but so you see in 2019 uh, for the S&P 500 companies, 21.1% uh, of new directorships were filled by ethnic minorities and 13.3% in the Russell 3000. Um, so there has been an improvement when you look at the year to year comparison uh, particularly in the, the S&P 500, but still um, a lot of work uh, to be done there. So that being said, that, that is kind of the cumulative impact of all of everything that Earl is, has mentioned. And it, it begs the question, what do we do? How do we proceed from here? Um, and I had a, uh, uh, I, I see it's an opportunity here uh, in, in summer of 2020 shortly after the murder of George Floyd. And there's a lot of attention around, hey, what, what should companies be doing? Uh, because of the relationship I have with uh, IDC, uh, doing research for them, I had an opportunity to uh, uh, publish a series of articles called Answering the Call, because there was a call for leaders to, in corporate America to step up and do something different to finally start to address these longstanding issues that uh, people of color in general have been experiencing and to finally resolve some of these disparities. Um, so what I want to walk you through is kind of my four um, kind of phase process. Uh, and these are just my thoughts based on my experiences. And uh, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, influenced by a lot of different resources. Uh, but I really tried to, to come up with really practical actions leaders can take today uh, to address, uh, start, to start this journey of, of, of uh, transforming the workplace culture and, and truly building a, a, a a fair, equitable, and just uh, environment for all employees. So the first paper um, and the first step is really around leadership and leading with integrity. Um, it's really important that uh, leaders embrace this opportunity to kind of acknowledge what's going on and condemn uh, the actions of, of, and the existence of systemic racism. Um, you got to step out. You got to make it known and make it clear that this is my, my position as a leader on this. This is our position as an organization. Um, and that shows all employees that you're going to lead with integrity. And, and then not just make a statement, but then start to do the work around reflecting and discussing as a leadership team, uh, creating a safe space for leaders to come together and reflect on how you know, systemic racism or racial disparities currently exist within the organization. Um, and then based on that initial assessment, make a commitment to mitigate those negative impacts of all forms of social injustice in the workplace um, and in your efforts to build a, a, a equal, fair and equitable uh, work environment for all. I also recommend three key leadership actions to prepare for the change, because this is a journey. This is not something that happens overnight. Um, you are fooling yourself. All leaders are fooling themselves. They think they're going to snap their fingers and fix this. this. It took a long time to get to this point, and it's going to take deliberate actions and a bit of a runway to, to start to come out of it. But these are, I think, three key actions that leaders can take to, to prepare the organization for such a transformational shift. Um, one being reimagining a new workplace culture. Um, that's really setting a new vision for the organization. Um, and, and one like, such as, you know, committing to you know, establishing a, a true meritocracy with a sense of belonging, firmly rooted in mutual respect for all employees, 
um, yeah, as an example. Um, so really reset, recasting who you're going to be and who, what you're going to be known for as an organization. Um, you also want to make sure in, in setting that new workplace culture, you're aligning it to your core values. It's very, very important to make sure it aligns to the values because that's the only way it's going to sustain itself uh, and feed itself. Um, so aligning it to the values is, is absolutely paramount. Uh, secondly, reframing the business case for DNI. Um, as Earl mentioned, uh, there are a lot of benefits when the more diverse your organization, uh, the more successful, more profitable, and that data has been out there for years, yet we're still in this place where we haven't significantly moved the needle. Um, there was an article um, written at, uh, by someone at Darden School of Business for the University of Virginia, and um, they, they really promoted this idea of, hey, let's not, when companies value diversity strictly uh, based on profitability, it's, there's not enough progress because they're really um, uh, commodify or uh, they're really taking advantage of of diversity in a, in a in for selfish gain and not because it's the right thing to do. Um, and really, at the core of it, that's where the conviction sets in. Where it's not about profitability; it's about doing the right things. And and that's always right to treat everyone fairly and equally, and to give everyone equal access and opportunity to thrive and be successful. And 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 and, and uh, you know, uh, grow their their careers. Um, and you know, along with reframing the business case, which we'll talk about a little later on, is the idea of corporate social justice. I think there's a huge opportunity. We've seen flashes of it. A lot of companies stepping forward and and establishing corporate just you know committing to corporate social justice initiatives. Um, we need to see more of that. And we'll kind of talk about how. Not just doing that is important, but coming together through those efforts and building a community of ac action around it can be truly impactful to, to driving change. Um, the last bullet here is around debunking common misconceptions. Anytime you drive a change, there's going to be misconceptions that exist uh, in the environment, particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, some of those may be, you know, diversity of thought fallacy, saying, hey, you know, there's a misconception that an organization can achieve the essential benefits of having a diverse and inclusive environment uh, by simply having more than one perspective in the room. And that doesn't cut it. Um, there's, there's, it's, it, there, it's, it needs to be a deeper uh, effort, um, a deeper impact uh, by um, bringing in those diverse perspectives, bringing in those uh, people with, who grew up in different environments with different backgrounds. That's what adds value to um, the, the, the workplace culture. Um, the unicorn effect uh, that there's this false narrative that qualified people of color are not easily available in the marketplace. We've seen that in the news um, and CEO, uh, CEO um, you know, made reference to that last summer and uh, uh, was, that was swiftly addressed. Um, and, and, and he recanted that statement because it's not true. It may take, you may have to identify new pipelines. Uh, it may take more effort to establish the pipelines to find access to the talent, but that, that, that unicorn effect is a, is a myth. Um, out there. The affirmative action aftermath, um, and I kind of characterize this as the, the common delusion that hiring managers are often expected to lower hiring standards uh, when recruiting people of color. Um, that is not necessary because there, are, there is qualified, diverse talent there um, and, and available. Um, and that, that really hurts the, the, you know, the person of color when they join the organization if they're tagged um, in that way uh, because it's hard to get, earn the respect and the credibility that Earl mentioned earlier is so critical to um, you know, future advancement with an organization. And the last myth I'll mention uh, that's in the article is around what about meism um, and the belief that diversity inclusion efforts exclude white employees. And that, that is not it. You cannot build an inclusive environment by excluding other groups. Um, there, there may be a different role, a different type of engagement, uh, but everyone has to be um, a part of this effort. So moving on to the next section around building genuine connections. Um, that is, uh, this is a step that all leaders must take uh, to really engage uh, you know, individuals that have been disadvantaged. Um, and, and, and this is where the hard work really starts to begin. Um, and, and in doing so, uh, before any leader steps into this conversation, they need to develop an informed perspective. Uh, educate yourselves. Uh, there's lots of books that have come out there's lots of concepts that get thrown around around DE&I. 
Um, and it's, it, it would serve a leader uh, well to, to understand what these concepts are and then what, how those concepts have impacted um, you know, the, the overall experience of, of, of black talent within the organization. So things like unconscious bias, microaggressions, uh, code switching, uh, racial gaslighting, uh, white privilege, black fatigue. Um, we hear those word, those, those terms tossed around a lot. Um, and it, it's important for leaders to really understand um, what they mean um, as they go to engage uh, in, in a genuine and, and sincere way uh, with uh, people of color. Uh, the other thing that's really important around this concept is, you know, according to research conducted by the Center for Talent and Innovation, 38% of Black professionals feel that it is never acceptable to speak out about experiences of bias at work. Um, so they're silent. Uh, even if they feel that they've been uh, uh, mistreated, they, they, don't, um, they don't feel comfortable often bringing it forward, and they don't trust that they're, um, you know, <laughs> That their 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 uh, statements will be uh, you know uh, protected and, and dealt with accordingly. So what does this lead to? Uh, alienation, uh, isolation, and really thirteen. They also went on. This, this study went on to say a thirteen uh, uh, black talent is thirteen times more likely to be disengaged at work. So now they're moving down the wrong way. And they're moving the wrong way on the performance scale uh, because they're not able to speak to and address the issue that they're encountering at work. Um, so leaders have to deliberately um, build trust uh, with, with uh, Black talent in the workplace. So how did they do that? Um, and that really comes down to a couple things. And that's a, one, building an inclusive culture um, by establishing a speak up culture for all employees. And so you kind of see uh, what that entails, ensuring that everyone gets heard, making it safe to propose new ideas, uh, taking advice and implementing feedback, sharing credit for team success. That, invites people, it, 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 it helps people feel valued and it lets them know it's okay. We wanna hear from you, your opinion matters. And I want to, as your leader, um, you know, hear your perspective uh, because it, it does add value to what we're trying to accomplish. And then secondly, uh, leaders need to listen and understand. Um, and you know, this is uh, really applying empathetic leadership skills um, on a daily basis, uh, whether it be nonverbal involvement practicing non-judgment, paraphrasing, asking questions. So it's really about show sincere engagement, uh, particularly if someone is opening themselves up and being transparent about what their experience has been in the workplace and not becoming defensive. And that's often uh, a major watch out where you wanna defend your position instead of listening to um, that person's point of view. Um, so, Earl, uh, before I move on, um, what specific actions have you seen leaders employ to effectively build, you know, genuine connections at work? Or how do you go about building genuine connections at work? Well, I, I sort of touched upon it before. The, the most important conversations for me, for my career, and for I advise for others, do not happen between nine o'clock and five o'clock. From 9 a.m. to 5 o'clock, if you ask a question, more often than not, you're going to get the company-sponsored, company-endorsed message. Everybody gets a fair chance, so on and so forth. I'll tell a quick story. Early in my career, one of the best mentor sponsors I had had a yacht, and he raced his yacht. Now, the dilemma when you race a yacht is that if you want to be competitive, you really need four people, OK? But a yacht race takes at least four hours. And if you have a family committing four hours of the afternoon, and a grandma, you can't guarantee it's four hours. It depends on the wind. If there's no wind, it could be eight hours, right? So four hours if you have some wind. Because I was young, had no children, and plenty of time on my hands on the weekends, I sailed with this executive most weekends. I was one part of the yacht crew. And when there was no wind, They'd crack open some beers, give up on the race, and spend a few hours having a conversation. I will tell you, that's when I learned who was important at the corporation, who was going to get promoted, who didn't you want to upset. Those conversations are invaluable. So, you know, that, that's those spending time with people outside of those hours when you can have real candid conversations are invaluable in terms of figuring out how to maneuver uh, in, in corporations. Because again, 
it's they got to know you, trust you, and like you. And, and, and it's hard to do that when we're all busy between nine and five. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so continuing on uh, to the next section is around uh, the next specific action is taking deliberate strategic actions. So looking internally and seeing based on your current processes, management practices, what can you do differently to, to drive a different outcome uh, within your organization? Um, you know, when you talk about transforming workplace culture, there's three, three main components that you want to focus on. That core values, leadership behaviors, and management processes. Um, and, and all of them need to be evaluated accordingly and, and when you're, you're looking to transform an organization because they're all connected to one another. Um, so when you talk about leadership behaviors, um, you know, organ I encourage leaders to take a step back and look at your leadership competencies. All companies have leadership competencies that they, they kind of ask their leaders to aspire to. Um, you might want to consider changing those or evaluating. Do you have the right leadership competencies that will help you be successful in this new, new era, this new vision that you're looking to promote? Um, so, you know, some new competencies that I've, I've seen kind of start to resonate around uh, include growth mindset, which is embracing continuous learning, uh, inclusive leadership, which is ensuring everyone has value, um, agile learner, which is learning from all experiences, particularly in the, the face of challenges and effectively applying lessons learned. And it, this one, I really like intellectual humility. Um, and this is a, a great concept. And it's really focused on accepting that you don't have all the answers and being open to learning from other people's perspectives, um, which is tough for a lot of people to do, a lot of leaders to do um, in, in corporate America, but it, it's paramount um, in this, in this uh, effort. You go a little bit deeper, um, you know, I really wanna challenge leaders to look at your, your internal processes, your management practices. Um, I am a, a, always been a proponent of uh, Lean and Six Sigma methodologies and the DMAIC process. And um, it, you can apply DMAIC and Lean to DE and I um, in a really impactful way, um, and and you know leaders really need to find a way to tie this effort to their management practice because now it's getting into your DNA, it's getting into everything that you do day in and day out. Um, so from a DMAIC perspective, uh, for those who aren't familiar with that uh, acronym, it's define, which is articulate the challenge. Um, this is where you you get your executive sponsorship. Um, you, get to, you build your project team that's typically cross-functional. So you have a diverse project team from different areas of the business coming together. And then you, you identify in a very clear, concise way your project charter. So what are you looking to accomplish? What are, you looking, what are your measures for success? Um, and, and you set those clear goals or, or KPIs or which are key performance indicators. Um, then you wanna measure, identify, uh, identify and access those KPIs. Uh, so once again, how are you gonna measure your success in the project? analyzing, so applying root cause analysis tools to prioritize your improvement. And this is really tough. This is where often a lot of these stall out, particularly with respect to a, a process like DE&I, because you have to be really disciplined and really focused to, to kind of apply what is not your typical kind of framework to a, 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 a different type of business problem. But by sticking with that um, and working your way through that, it, it often will, will uh, bring, drive, uh, bring clarity to what you need to accomplish to really root out the, the issue uh, that you're trying to tackle. And then you wanna improve uh, and create an executive uh, and execute a comprehensive action plan and then um, you know, put in measures to control your, 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 uh, and sustain your progress. So you wanna monitor and sustain progress at that last step. Um, here are some examples of you know, some potential DEI pra -E practices that may come out um, of, of uh, an initiative like this, such as, you know, from a recruitment perspective, developing a diverse university relations recruitment strategy, or cultivating for, uh, strategic partnerships with diverse professional organizations. Um, and from a development perspective, uh, encouraging people of color to participate in networking events, uh, making sure they're, they're included in all professional development programs. Um, I've found in my experiences that is one of the, that's low hanging fruit. Uh, when you talk about advanced within an organization, if if you look at who's attending your, your programs that are getting them, you know, getting uh, your employees ready for advancement, if it doesn't include people of color or black talent, then you're never gonna see um, you know, progress. You're never gonna see people advancing and moving forward in the organization because they're missing out on these development opportunities. Um, you know, on the advancement side, 
encouraging corporate sponsorship opportunities for people of color uh, and including, uh, you know, people of color and people of color and succession planning strategies. So looking at those very critical core practices in a, 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 through a diverse lens. And then lastly, uh, from a retention perspective, analyzing employee turnover data, conducting exit interviews, stay interviews, focus groups, understanding what is the real experience for uh, black talent uh, so that you can adjust all these other things uh, from an overall um, you know, HR perspective to improve their overall employee experience. And at the end of the day though, um, the other challenge with doing this is that you don't wanna have a DE&I -E campaign you may start off as a campaign because you need to draw attention to it, but the ultimate goal should be to drive your DE&I into your everyday practices. So it just becomes common uh, activities. It's just the way you conduct yourself, the way you do business, and it's just part of a core anchor within your HR talent strategy. Um, so Earl, uh, uh, one, one question for you here. Um, you're the executive sponsor of the uh, African American ERG uh, for your organization. Um, how do you kind of see, you know, ERGs play a critical role. Um, how do you see uh, ERG groups continuing to support, uh, to, you know, helping organizations address DEI issues for Black talent? I'll tell you what a, a major goal of mine with the ERG is at Pratt Whitney, and I've been the executive champion for over 10 years. Uh, two critical roles that we play is number one, when we recruit people into the organization, we want them to have a place where they feel uh, uh, affirmation. So that is to say, our company is huge and complex. Uh, can I call some people? Can I rely on some people to help me figure out how things work? Anything from where do I get a haircut? Where do I get good sushi? All of these things, if you come from out of town, you need an affinity group to kind of help you with those, just to make you feel comfortable in the environment. Later on, though, the goal is to prepare people to be more comfortable speaking out in the wider organization. So the conversations we're having here, I have similar conversations depending on where people are in the corporation and where they are in their career uh, to sort of inform them of the same things that I learned on the yacht. Who do, there are certain people, quite frankly, they're anointed. They're gonna do well in the corporation. You want other people to know, look, you don't necessarily wanna upset that person because that person is going to be in a, in a higher leadership position than they are today. So I think one is to make them feel an affinity for the company by feeling affinity in the group. And then two is to sort of prepare them uh, to engage at various levels, depending on, again, where they are in the com company, where their competencies are. Uh, and in some cases, it's really to uh, give them some inside information, particularly where I have insight where someone may not be well thought of or may not be positioned well. I can give them some insights to, to address those things. So um, as an executive champion, those are some of the things I do. And then of course, the larger organization gets organized around delivering, you know, mentoring events, uh, learning events, uh, and, and things like that, that, that just provide resources and information to, uh, to, the, to the groups. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, the last section I wanna cover um, before we get to the Q&A is uh, activating a new community, activating new community engagements. I think that this is um, kind of like I said, what we've seen a lot of companies doing. Um, and I think we need to double down on this if we really wanna move the needle um, with respect to uh, addressing racial uh, disparities in our society. Um, just a little data before I move to the next slide um, around the business case for corporate, so corporate social justice. Um, there was a recent survey that, that found that 64% of employees globally believe that CEOs can create positive changes in prejudice and discrimination. 54% uh, of employees globally believe that CEOs should speak publicly on controversial political and social issues that I care about. And 53% of consumers um, that uh, uh, feel that every brand has a responsibility to get involved in at least one social issue that does not directly impact its business. So, you know, employees expect their you know, companies to get more involved. Consumers are saying they're looking for companies to get more involved in the community and in this fight for social justice. And um, I, I, I think now, like I said, we've seen some progress and I think we just need to continue to see more activity in this area. But how do companies do that? Uh, I think there's three specific questions uh, that I found that uh, they need to ask themselves. 
One is, does the issue align with your company's strategy? Once again, it needs to align to your strategy and strategic goals. Um, can you me meaningfully influence the issue that you're looking to target? And will your constituencies uh, agree or constituents agree with you speaking out on that particular topic? Those are three very specific things that any executive leadership team needs to consider before they, as they work to try to figure out how to get engaged in, in corporate, corporate social justice reform. Um, as noted here on the slide, um, you wanna identify the, the issue, um, encourage all employees to get actively involved. You also wanna engage the board of directors and any other key constituents, third party vendors, uh, customers, uh, uh, whoever's in your ecosystem to get actively involved because you know by partnering with other and then also look for opportunities to partner with other companies and community organizations they may be not for profits maybe competitors that are in your space but you have similar interests to help tackle this issue um and 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 come together and pool resources and and drive synergy that way and and you kind of end up i think leading to this force multiplier effect when uh you know people with like uh minded uh, interests come together. There are a couple examples I wanted to share with you. Um, Netflix, I'm sure many of you, I mean, everyone knows who Netflix is, and they've really stepped out um, back in the, um, they're one of the first big companies to really make a real investment um, in social justice reform. Um, back in, but going back, even before this past summer in 2019, they began facilitating conversations with black executives from multiple industries and corporate functions across the United States. And during these candid uh, discussions, uh, you know, it, these, these black executives provided feedback on what their ex personal experiences have been with respect to racial inequalities in the workplace and what are some, what they thought were solutions. Um, I had an opportunity to attend one of these sessions in New York back in March, and it was really insightful um, to see this, this group of black executives from various organizations coming together to talk on this topic. And I share that with you because there was power in the dialogue because as always with this, because as a result of one of those conversations that led to the second bullet here where they announced this new corporate commitment to invest 2% of their cash holdings into financial institutions and organizations that, re that directly support black communities across the US. So that was a, like I said, an outcome from this, you know, uh, uh, this conversation that they had started prior to uh, this past summer. And it led to a great initiative that really fit their culture and help move the needle um, and, and, and kind of stake their flag in social justice initiatives. Um, and then you kind of see the result of it. Like earlier this month, uh, they released their first inclusion report, which included demographic data, plans to continuously improve that you know, demographics and specific actions to cultivate a culture of belonging and allyship, um, which if you haven't read that, and if you're interested, I highly recommend that you check out that report. It's probably, it, I think they're setting a new standard for how Companies should be reporting on their DNI metrics each year uh, because they're not just speaking to the numbers; they're speaking to how they're doing it and and and, and how they're working to to promote inclusion across um, their 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 organization. Um, I also had the opportunity to uh, you know drive social justice reform with my organization. Uh, we are a title insurance company, um, and so we work in the real estate space, and so. I was able to get buy-in from the CEO and the senior management team to uh, say, hey, what can we do differently? So we took a stand, we made a public statement. Uh, we put together a very robust uh, strategic plan that included training and development opportunities, engaging our agents and customers, um, but also engaging our staff on a specific issue around improving minority home ownership. Um, those rates are, uh, when you look at the data, uh, African-Americans are at about 46% home ownership in the US uh, and versus, uh, you know, uh, white households, uh, white ownership is around 76, 77%. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, I also believe in grass, taking a grassroots uh, approach to social justice reform, but also taking a top down approach to it. So I thought it was important to engage the board of directors. And so they're gonna have their own initiative around promoting fair housing standards in Connecticut. And they've committed uh, to, to just that and fostering new partnerships uh, and strategic relationships and not within our, not just within our ecosystem with other organizations. And then lastly, um, you know, you got to fund these events or these activities. And so uh, I, I expanded the scope of the CADIC Foundation to economically support various social justice initiatives that the company is uh, interested in pursuing, uh, which is also 
uh, has been very uh, uh, beneficial. So uh, before I move on, and there are other examples of this. Like, so if you just check the newspaper, there's lots of information out there. There's another organization called One, uh, a startup called One Ten, uh, where it's a great it's a great example of 35 companies coming together and making a pledge uh, with 100 million dollars of of a seed funding to uh, 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 create a million jobs for Black uh, uh, Americans over the next 10 years. Uh, it's another great, it'll be interesting to see how that program comes together, but it's a great example of companies kind of coming together, creating synergy to really um, you know, push the envelope with respect to social justice reform. Um, Earl, are there any other notable uh, initiatives that you kind of corporate social justice initiatives that have caught your attention in the news? Yeah, I'll, I'll point out too briefly, the NASDAQ, which, is, which lists public stocks is now requiring, if you want to be listed on the NASDAQ, you have to have uh, women and minority on your board of directors or explain why. And again, that links back to the McKinsey study that says this is actually a benefit to the corporations. The other one is Allstate. It, Allstate did a, uh, a fundraising on the securities uh, exchanges or in the securities market. And typically big players like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs are the go-to places. They put billions of dollars, they raised billions of dollars and said, I will only place this with minority owned investment firms, which means they had to employ a lot more firms. Um, some people would have said, couldn't be done. They just don't have enough minority firms to, to generate um, billions of investment through these security assets. Wildly successful, wildly successful. They sold out almost instantaneously by going through these firms. Um, so they, they debunked the myth that you had to go through Goldman Sachs and these large corporations and that minority organizations couldn't deliver on such a, a placement of, uh, of investments. Um, so those are two notable ones uh, that quite frankly are paradigm shifts. Absolutely. Thank you. So as I'm wrapping up, uh, just to summarize these actions, you know, leading with purpose and personal conviction, building genuine connections, taking deliberate strategic actions and activating new community engagements is, is uh, I think the key to really moving the needle uh, in corporate America and, 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 and uh, cultivating a more fair, equitable and just work environment for black talent and all employees. Um, so with that, Earl, um, I guess we'll transition to a, a Q&A or you wanna kind of close it out as we do No, I think, uh, I think just wonderful summary and I think we'll turn it over to Tracy to, uh, to uh, facilitate some Q&A. Wow, Damon and Earl, thank you both so, so much. I have a lot of notes here and I <laughs> can't wait to actually watch the video again. To, <laughs> there was so much richness and so much insight you provided, thank you. So we did have a lot of interesting comments and questions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna try to start with this one. It was, it's interesting about your discussion related to relationships outside of the nine to five. And there was some energy around that, especially potentially from women who feel like those are harder to access. And also um, people who do have families that they're managing at home. And also the struggle of just getting that invitation in the first place. So can you talk a little bit more about those nuances? Yeah, let me start with um, two thoughts. Number one is, the, the women aspect is a real one. I'll, I'll tell you a real story. On that yacht, it was just two of us that day. We couldn't get four people. We sailed with two, no wind. We cracked some beer, talking to this senior executive who owns the yacht. And he said, you know, you have an advantage, right, Earl? And I'm thinking, really? I have an advantage? He said, yeah, because I thought about inviting one of your women colleagues, but I was afraid that I would be in a circumstance just like this, where we'd be out on a yacht me and a young woman uh, sailing. And I don't think that my wife would have accepted that. And I said, wow, that's, I guess I do have some male privilege here um, that I have to acknowledge. But on the point about, you know, how do you find time? If you read this book, Empowering Yourself, it's very clear, spending time outside of work, you have to see it as an investment. It's a sacrifice. And if your family is not on board, it's going to be a struggle. And, and I will argue that at the most senior levels of the company, the, the line between your personal and your professional gets very, very blurred. Back to if you commit a crime and you're an executive of the company, 
they're reporting that you're an executive of the company. It gets very blurred. So if you're not willing to make that sacrifice, then you're making a conscious decision. I'll, I'll give you an example. I don't enjoy playing golf, but I have two sets of golf clubs. One set is very expensive and I've been playing for 20 years, okay? It's not my favorite thing to do, but it was an investment. I spent a lot of time with customers, with senior leaders, because that's what they like to do. And golf, as you know, is not an hour exercise. If you play 18 holes, which I hate to play 18 holes, it just seems like a huge sacrifice in time. And if you play like I play, that's at least a two and a half hour commitment. So if you want it, you have to give up some of that time. It's, it's time away from your kids. It's time away from your family. But this book would argue, and I would confirm, it's the investment that you have to make. And I would add, too, that um, Oregon, you mentioned the golf. I think it's a great example. There are a lot of people that struggle with golf and getting out there, and a lot of decisions are made out there. And in our business, we found uh, we have a, heavy, a, a sales organization, um, and we saw a gap where there weren't enough uh, women going out and golfing. They didn't feel comfortable going out and golfing. They didn't know how to play golf. Um, and so there was opportunity for the organization to try to break that is, you know, address that issue. So we started, we pay for golf lessons. We, we incur, we built our, we had our own golf league so we could create within a safe environment for people to kind of get comfortable with that kind of scenario. So they can get out and network and, and, and get involved and, and, and meet after hours um, and build that capability, that networking capability that is so important. So organizations can play a critical role in helping to facilitate some of those engagements as well, if people are interested in doing so. Thank you. And we had a question here about recommendations on locating and investing in companies that have diverse boards or management. Is there an easy way of doing that? Is there are resources we can tap into for that? The answer is yes. I can't refer you to them right off the top of my head, but um, there's several resources out there that for, they have, you know, you can do anything from socially conscious and in, uh, environmental um, investing to uh, finding uh, companies that have diverse boards. So it, it is available out there. Unfortunately, um, I can't call it off the top of my head. I'm certain that the NASDAQ will be reporting that because they're making that a requirement um, to, to list on their exchange. Thank you. And um, one simple question, yes or no question, are you willing to offer the slides? Am I, can I make them available to everyone after the presentation? Is that okay? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, <laughs> and um, here's another question and then we can turn it over to people who would like to ask their own. So someone had mentioned that Damon, you've been able to lead your own company and several others to begin programs with real tangible objectives and accountabilities. Can you talk more about that? Um, I mean, it's been a work in progress. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really seizing those opportunities and, and looking for, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough in my current position to be able to, um, you know, I'm in a different position to influence. And that hasn't always been the case. Um, you know, when I was working in much larger organizations, I could only kind of influence within my sphere um, of, you know, and my, my direct uh, kind of footprint. Uh, but uh, I, even in those times, I learned to do what I could with what I had. It's because I think that helped prepare me for when I had the opportunity to really make the broader kind of impact um, and, and put out, put together programs and initiatives that can, um, you know, uh, have some uh, level of success. So um, it's a work, you, it, no matter where you're at, start, get, you know, make, do what you can with what you got. And, uh, you know, you'll learn from it and it'll just get you ready for the next thing when those, those larger, those bigger opportunities become available. Great. So if other, if people, I see Brian Hux has a question. Yeah, great. Hey, thanks for putting on this event. It's, um, it's been really interesting. Uh, Damon, um, Earl talked about this uh, concern of um, getting the benefit of the doubt. And he actually said he made career decisions not to go to new companies um, because of that extra obstacle at the new company. And so I just wonder, you said you've been at a few different places. Um, how, how has been your experience for that? And 
uh, for people that are coming to a new company. We get a lot of new hires in our company now. Um, you know, do you have advice for how to overcome uh, that concern as a person of color? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have moved around um, within my career um, and there's lots of different reasons for that. Some voluntary, um, you know, choices I made um, and, and others that it just was, it was just time to move on. Um, and so, you know, it is tough. It is a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that if people have to be willing to um, try to do their best to hit the ground running and establish, you know, get the lay of the land very quickly, you know, back to the idea of building a relationship, understand, I think that's where the orientation becomes really, really important for new people coming into the, to the environment, making sure they're making the connections to the right folks within the company and really understanding those unwritten rules, you know, how things really get done. Um, and, and I think it puts people in the best position to be successful, to learn very quickly how they can grow and, 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 and who they should be connecting with within the organization. Um, and, and at the end of the day though, uh, I, I am a firm believer of, you know, whether you've been your new employee or someone that's been there for years, at the end of the day, they're gonna be looking at performance and how you're showing up for work day in and day out, what you're delivering, what kind of impact you're having on the organization. Um, and uh, I think that's, 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 as long as you're, you're doing that um, and then caring for these um, other uh, uh, tangibles, <laughs> these other, other uh, you know, that Earl had referenced uh, with respect to relationships and building bridges, uh, you find that balance. Thank you. Are there any other questions? And again, you can raise your hand, or you can just unmute yourself. Anyone, William? Bill Pickens, I think uh, I think she was calling on you. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I, I was simply uh, first thanking uh, Earl and Damon uh, for really, really uh, extraordinary uh, sharing of information because some of these questions are being asked not only in um, academia, but in, in business itself. For instance, like, uh, I have a question for both Earl and uh, Damon, and it has to do with diversity training. And I read an article in the uh, re a recent article, uh, edition rather, of the Harvard Business Review. And I also uh, noted that in that uh, issue, they referenced the uh, conference board, which is, uh, as everyone here knows, what that is probably one of the most influential magazines in business. And it had to do with diversity training. And they're saying, and I noticed earlier, someone wrote, this information is not new. Somebody said that. And I thought about that article. And I'm asking Earl to kind of address, what, why is it that some of the things that the problems inherent in diversity training in these major corporations, these problems have been in existence for 20, 30 years. So why aren't we solving those problems? Is it because senior management, you don't have buy-in from senior management? That's a question. Earl, you, 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 deal, you are senior management now. Maybe you can share with us. Why, why aren't we solving diversity training, period? Yeah, so I'll try to give a brief answer, but at the end of the day, yeah. educate you, a company in the course of, let's say, two days can't educate people enough on why we have some of the biases that we already have. Quite frankly, you have to go all the way back into the education system, which without going too deep historically, it's very intentional that you know very little bit about black history. Okay. 
okay. the time that black the time that schools became public education became public I think it was about the end of the 1800s beginning of the 1900s before public education became compulsory it originally started state by state but remember the early 1900s was a horrible time for african americans and discrimination yeah. lynching was at a, a, a so high i think i think roughly two people were lynched a week right during this time right. so at the end of the day we're missing a lot of education a lot so we have biases that haven't been addressed now fast forward and what can we do about it without going through a long history lesson yeah the most important thing as i see it is having me in the room when that leadership development discussion is happening. I can't tell you how many times I call out terms like, well, that woman has sharp elbows. Early in my career, I would hear something like that and that would be like the end of the discussion. And now I ask, give me more, give me specific examples. How is that impacting the performance of that person and the, and the, the, the organization that that person is in? Because sometimes these are, um, dog whistles that people don't even necessarily understand. But I mean, if you're a woman on the phone and you've been in corporate America, you may, it may resonate with you that if you exhibit the exact same behaviors as a male does, the yeah. male is considered very assertive and you're considered to have sharp elbows, right? When you're consciously aware of that, you know, the, you know this person has, doesn't communicate well. What exactly does that mean? Tell, give me an example where that person isn't communicating well and it's affecting the performance of that organization so i think the most important thing today is at least at my company we talk about the pipeline we don't have a pipeline issue we just went through our ldr process we do not have a pipeline issue we have plenty of people when you look at the education of the african-american people that are on our on our list of, of future leaders education is not necessarily a good indicator of performance However, unfortunately, it does disqualify you sometimes. Those African-Americans, if you look at the ranking of the universities they went to, they overwhelmingly are the top ranked universities while the rest of the population has a much more diverse set of universities to get to the leadership ranks. I will argue that we've debunked it at Pratt & Whitney that we got a pipeline issue. Now it's time to put people in the roles and the more people we have in the room, that can ask the right questions, the more likely we are to see progress. That's my personal opinion. That's what I'm advocating for in my company. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that a lot of companies lean too heavily on training. And they say, okay, we did our training. Everybody got the message. We, we should be good. We should start to see a change in behavior. And it, and it goes back to uh, addressing the culture, acknowledging that you need to make a change, setting a new standard and then looking at all the inputs that you need to adjust to successfully achieve and bring to fruition that new kind of uh, experience as an organization. And so you really get to rooting out what are the issues and, and, and then putting, taking a more holistic approach. You can't take a narrow approach to this because if you, you, you take a narrow approach to it, they're just training or just attacking one pillar of it. You're leaving a lot, you're, 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 you're leaving a lot on the table to still be addressed and you and it just keeps hanging around it just keeps hanging around and I, I think at the end of the day um it does come down to personal conviction too um I think there you know hearts have to be changed um and and that's why it's important to heighten awareness and acknowledgement of what's going on a lot of people have it's surprising to me just because I get the feeds on my social feed on all this data that my feed is not the same as everybody else's feed. Not everybody's seeing the same information I'm seeing. So um, when you share this type of data with folks, sometimes it's shocking because they have, they're just not paying attention to it. It's not of interest. Um, and I think that's where it's got to start with kind of getting, getting people to change their perspective and realizing that there's a huge opportunity here that, that we all have to come together to address. Division allows this thing to continue to fester. And we, as we have to start to build these communities around actually addressing this issue, uh, whether it be corporate communities or engaging with our other not-for-profits that have been um, working on these these matters. So there's just, there's just, it's, it's a complex matter, but we just gotta be committed to doing something different and figuring out how we learn and continue to grow together through it. 
So I think we have time for maybe one more question. If, if Lou, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I, I'm very intrigued what you're saying about heightened awareness. And my question is, if we can process and practice in our life, it would be very helpful in our life. And, and that, that would be a place we can practice and that would help management because if you just have it in management and with all these philosophical understandings, which is really terrific. And then if you go home and you're not doing it, mm -hmm. that we have to work that in and, and find that that's what we're processing now. Uh, not only in the talk today, but, but what's happening this summer and everything else, we're all being more intimate and allowing us to, to more talk with each other. And that's with everybody. I was just wondering what you thought about that. I completely agree with you. Uh, the more you, you know, you, you, you take what you're learning at, at, at work and applying it at home, because that's just, it becomes part of who you are and it starts to shape your, 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 you know, how you see the world. Um, and it's going to change the way you behave in the world. And that's going to, lead to a domino effect because that's going to impact how you interact with other people in the world. Um, so um, yes, it, at the end of the day, it starts with us as individuals, um, seeing the opportunity and, and, and being committed to doing functioning differently, not just in the workplace, but at home as well. And then the workplace on the flip side has to be able to create an environment that allows people to feel comfortable bringing those perspectives in and not getting shot down and, 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 and vilified for having a different point of view or are or, or vilified for bringing up calling out a wrong in the workplace. Um, people have to feel comfortable to do that because we all have to find our ways to hold each other accountable. And when something inappropriate occurs, it needs to be addressed because if it's not, you're condoning it uh, by not doing so. Um, so it's it, it works. It cuts both ways, in my opinion. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that a, a company has a culture and it's important that you get people in your company that match that culture. In some cases, that could be a terrible culture, but some places that could be a good culture. But it's, it's awfully hard to think that somebody's going to behave one way at work and have a totally different mindset when they go home. Um, so I think it, it is important that when you build your company, um, you know, there's some element of culture in terms of, of, of who you bring in and, and, and who you promote. Um, and I do see another hand up. So Earl and Damon, do you have time for one more question? <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jane, did you have a question? Well, actually, no, my, my, uh, I, I just want to thank um, Earl and Damon for this incredible um, conversation. I think that what you talked about um, with corporate executives applies to a way broader uh, group or a, a way broader segment of our population. Any organization, any group, any church benefits from all that you talked about today. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you both for spending this time with us. We had a really good turnout today. I also want to um, tell everybody about a, um, the next forum we're having is on um, February 10th. It's a Wednesday at seven and it's about fair housing opportunity and race. And so it's kind of a continuation of this kind of conversation we're having. And um, you can just go out to the AHCC website and find it and register and join us for that. Um, and that's really all I had to say. And I just wanna thank people for attending. It's really an honor to have the opportunity to, to share this with you and, and an honor that, uh, that you were willing to take the time to, uh, to come and listen. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Earl and Jane for the invite and, and Tracy as well to be a part of this. So you guys are doing tremendous work uh, through these, these forum discussions and um, it's, it's impactful. Um, and so thank you for letting me be a part of it. <laughs>